It is so good to see you this weekend, and I want to welcome each of you, and whether you are in Rock Island, Kiwani, joining us online, or right here in Bettendorf, I am grateful that you're here. You see, when we gather in moments like this, it's not just simply to check the I went to church box, right? We gather in moments like this, desperate to grab hold of Jesus. We gather to worship the very God who created us the God who loves us, the the God who gave his life for us, the one who identifies himself as Emmanuel, God with us. You see, these moments that we gather like this are incredibly important. And they're so important. In fact, the author of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews chapter 10, he says, and do not give up meeting together as some are doing. He says, don't give up. But he goes on to say, but encourage one another and all the more as Jesus' return is approaching. And I realize that some of us come into these spaces this weekend longing for that encouragement that the author writes about. In fact, my prayer has been, and it continues to be, that you will engage the word of the Lord today, that you will be encouraged both through the worship, but also as we engage God's word together today. In fact, as we engage God's word, uh, we're going to continue our journey to Christmas in this Advent season. Now, as we've talked about before, Advent is a period of active waiting. It's a time of preparation for some of us. It's a time of anticipation of Jesus' return. Now, we know that Jesus came on Christmas Day, right? And we believe by faith that Jesus is going to return in that second coming. But our hope and our heart as a church and as a people is that we want to be found faithful in waiting well. In fact, that's why we've taken a series of conversations leading up uh, to Christmas in this Advent season to really explore what it means for us to take hold of the gift of peace, the gift of hope, the gift of joy that God offers us through faith. In Jesus. Now, last few weeks, we've taken a look at the, the gift of peace and the gift of hope, and, and even last week, the, the gift of faith. And today, we're going to take a look at the gift of joy. Now, like some of you, I love Christmas. Anybody love Christmas season? All right, after Thanksgiving is the key thing there, right? But, but, but I love Christmas. I love the songs. I love the silent night, whole, oh, holy night. I love joy to the world like we sang together this weekend. I mean, those are classic songs. I even love the songs like Jingle Bells and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And yes, I even love Grandma Got Ran Over by a Reindeer, okay? So don't judge me, all right? But it, it, I love the music. I mean, I, I love the music of Christmas. I love the Christmas lights. Anybody like the Christmas lights? And they are especially awesome if you have a pair of these bad boys right here that you just throw on and every single Christmas light looks like a large snowman coming your way, all right? It's especially cool if at night when it's dark, you put those on while you're driving, all right? And you're coming up, you're coming up to a stoplight and it's like a 30 foot tall red snowman bearing down on you. And it is awesome. Or so I've heard. Pastor Sean kind of mentioned that somewhere along the way that that was a good idea. So, um, but here's the deal. I love the Christmas lights. I love the music. I love the, the activities that come along with Christmas. I mean, the, the Christmas parties just this week, I like put beard oil in my beard and I put red glitter and went to a party. I mean, it was awesome. And, and I love the white elephant gift exchanges and the laughter that's around those moments. And, and the ugly sweaters are amazing, all right? Like, they are awesome. And don't get me started on the food, seriously. Like, Christmas cookies, like, oh, Lord. All right, anyways. But I love all of those things about Christmas. But can I tell you what I love the most about Christmas? It's that sense or that that sense of anticipation or that sense of joy that we see all around us, both those in the church and those outside of the church. Now, I realize that doesn't mark every space or every person, but you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, these are the kids who have the countdown to Christmas Day moments. These are the times with friends where we're we're gathering and we're laughing together. This is even the interaction with the cashier at the gas station who normally grunts at you in the morning. But in Christmas, she's looking at you in the eye and is happy to see you and says, Merry Christmas. I mean, we know about these things, don't we? I mean, it's the awe and the wonder of seeing a a 34-foot Santa inflatable with 140-some others in one yard, right? I mean, it's crazy, but I love it. And I think the reason I love it so much is that we get just a glimpse, just a glimpse of the gift of joy that God made available to us through Christmas. 
You see, how we define joy in our world today, based on, you know, Webster's Dictionary, is the emotion evoked by well-being, by success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. They also define it as a source or cause of delight. Now, many of us resonate with this definition, don't we? I mean, when things are going well and and our kids are behaving and we got money in the bank and the business is thriving and we're rolling down the road in our Tesla, you guys know what I'm talking about? We're like, this is joy, baby. (laughs) You're, You're driving saying, I got joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart today, right? Like, this is what we talk about when we think of joy in our world. But I want you to know, as we engage scripture today, And we look at the gift of joy that's available to you and I by faith because of Christmas, because God came. It radically changes how we define joy. Now, as we jump into scripture together today, we're going to take a look at two radically different groups of people. In fact, I would say they couldn't be any, any more different, whether it came to status or reputation or influence, even their culture, even their race. I mean, these people are radically different. And so I encourage you, grab your uh, Bible, turn to Luke chapter 2. We're going to get there in just a moment. But as we look at these individual groups, we're going to see that although they were very different, they both encountered the gift of joy when they encountered Jesus. So as we get into Luke chapter 2, just to catch you up, last week we began, uh, we talked about Mary and the moment that the angel came to Mary and said, Mary, you are going to be the mother of the child of God. And there was this incredible moment of faith, just uh, reckless faith that Mary, knowing some of the sacrifice that it would mean for her, knowing that it would radically change her life. And she said to the angel, she said, just as you said, so let it be. And it was this moment where she says, God, I trust you. And she grabs hold of faith. And then fast forward roughly nine months. I think that's about how long a child takes to, you know, cure egg in the womb or bake or whatever you want to say. And anyways, nine months later, the day comes. Jesus is born. The son of God is born. Emmanuel, God with us. The day is here. Christmas is here. And this is when we read these words. Luke chapter 2. It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. Now, let me pause there for a minute. Because if we don't understand what a shepherd is, we lose the significance of this passage of scripture. You see, shepherds in Jesus's day, when Jesus was born, I mean, they were the lowest of low on the social rung. I mean, they were right there alongside tax collector and poop picker uppers, all right? Like, literally, that's where the shepherds were. They had, no, they had no civil rights. They, they wouldn't even, their testimony wouldn't even be approved in the court of law at that time. I mean, they were lonely. They were despised. In fact, the term that was used for shepherds in that time was the technical, technical term of sinners. This, in other words, they were part of a class that were deeply despised. And so here are the shepherds out in the fields doing their job. And it says this, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. How many are like, well, no, duh, right? They're normally by themselves, and all of a sudden, an angel appears, and the glory of God shone. I mean, I'm sure they jumped behind the sheep and wet themselves. Like, that is what happened right here. They are scared to death. But look at what the angel says to them. It says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great what? Help me. I will bring you good news that causes what? Great joy. That's right. For all people. Goes on to say, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you just to make sure you get the right child. They say, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. I mean, this is crazy. This is crazy. And if it couldn't get even crazier, literally in the following scriptures, the following verses after this, it says that a great host, a great multitude of angels appeared. And literally a worship concert breaks out in which the angels are saying, glory to God, glory to God in the highest and and peace on earth to whom God's favor rests. I mean, there's this massive moment of worship. And I don't know if it was like verse, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, chorus, bridge, and then there was an outro. But eventually the music stopped, the angels disappeared, and the shepherds look at deer in the headlights, looked at each other and said, you know what? I think we better check this out. Let's go, let's go see if, if what we just heard was true. Now, I love this story 
And I love it for a number of reasons, but for one reason is, is that when I consider how excited parents we are when we see that pregnancy test for the first time and how that next nine months is is marked by anticipation and excitement we just can't wait for the day for that child to come right true think about this God the Father knew this day was coming for thousands of years go back to Genesis chapter 3 the first prophecy of the Messiah God the Father knew this day was going to happen in that moment. And what blows my mind is that out of all the people, God the Father is so excited, so pumped up. I want to tell somebody, I want to tell somebody. He sends the angels to tell the lowly, despised, rejected shepherds. It's crazy. It's crazy. He sends the angels to them to say, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. So fast forward, let's go to Matthew chapter 2. You see, at this same time that, that Jesus is born and the, the shepherds are, are engaged in a worship concert with the angels, the same time something else is happening. A star is being formed. In fact, this isn't a star like just any normal star. This, this star is different. And as it rose up into the sky, although the shepherds may not have taken notice, notice Mary and Joseph probably didn't even know that it was there. But there was a group of people who were radically different than the shepherds. In a far off land, radically different, looked different, had different privileges. But they took notice. Look at Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, now Magi, some of us hear the words wise men or in other, uh, other places you'll hear kings, right? We three kings of Orient are, that's that, okay? These were, these, were, these were people of influence. They had wealth. They, um, they were most likely astrologers. It says Magi from the east. They're from the east. They're non-Jews. They're very different than the shepherds. They're, they're Gentiles. They're, they're from far away east, most likely Persia, somewhere in that reign. But it says Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. These were magi or astrologists that would, literally would have been watching the stars because they believed that, that based on the movement of those stars, they could predict what the future held. And so as they were doing their everyday task, watching the stars move around and trying to discern what that meant, they saw a star rise that was radically different. And so they went back and they began to research, what is it about this star that's different? They went to the religious leaders who maybe were exiles from the Jews and, and, and they went to them and they determined that this wasn't just any old star. This star represented that a king had been born and not just any king. This was the king of the Jews. And so they went out. They started on a mission. They're going to go find this king of the Jews so that they can worship him. And the logical place to go is Jerusalem, right? Right? to go to the most influential city in that, in that place where they would go and they would expect to see the king there. So they go to Jerusalem, they tell King Herod, and then it says, verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Of course, King Herod was disturbed. He knew about this Messiah that was to come. And in his mind, this Messiah, as he rose up, would take and conquer his kingdom and dethrone him. And so he was disturbed, to say the least. In fact, it says that he called together the chief priests and the religious leaders of the time, and, and he had them brought to them. And he said, okay, where is this Messiah supposed to be born? And they go on to quote Micah chapter 5, where it says, this Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. And after their interaction, they come up with a plan. The, the King Herod calls the Magi back and he, and he drills them over and over on when did that star appear? Why is that so important? Because he wants to know how old the Messiah is, doesn't he? Yep. And so he says, tell me when it appeared. And then he comes up with this idea. He says, listen, you go to Bethlehem, you see and find this Messiah and then come back and tell me because I want to worship him. That's not what he wanted to do, but that's what he told the Magi, right? And so here's what happens starting in verse nine. It says this, after they had heard the king, they went out on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. You see, they came to Jerusalem looking for the king. Once they got to Jerusalem, the star is what led them to Bethlehem. Listen to this. Even to the very place that he was. It says this, when, the, when they saw the star, they were what? Help me out. 
when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And it says, I'm coming to the house. Now, let me pause here for a moment, all right? This is like bonus material, has nothing to do with our message today. So if you want to check out, that's okay, but don't, because this is really important, all right? It says that they came to the house. Let me ask you today, where was Jesus born? A manger or a stable, right? And it says that they came to the house. Now, this is significant because Jesus was probably about a year or two old at this time, you know? I had somebody ask me this week, like, what's your favorite part of Christmas? And, and you'll get a little insight into how twisted I am. I said, I, I enjoy going to, to homes with people. When I see their nativity sets and I see the Magi or the wise men there, I like to take them. And I like to go and put them on the other side of the house without them knowing because it's my love and care for them. I want a biblically accurate nativity scene. All right. So anyways, I had nothing to do with the message. But here's the deal. Jesus was a child. He was a child when they came to that house and they saw him, a one or two year old child. And it says, and upon coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped him. And then it says, then they opened their treasures, very different than the shepherds, right? Because they came with some stuff. They had influence. They had wealth. It says, and he opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold, gifts of frankincense and gifts of myrrh. Now these were significant. They weren't just like random gifts. These spoke about who Jesus was. You see, the gold meant that Jesus, they knew was gonna be the king. In fact, he wasn't going to be the king. Jesus already was the king. He was born the king. The frankincense was, would have been offered in worship by the priest. And this is an element in which it's saying they're acknowledging that Jesus is not, not only a priest, he's God. And then the myrrh would have been a, kind of a foreshadowing of the type of death that Jesus would die for us. Two groups of people, radically different. The shepherds who had nothing, who lacked, who were isolated, who were despised, and the magi, the wise men, who in some ways seemed like they had it all. Now listen, each of us today maybe find ourselves identifying with one or the other. Maybe we walk through the doors this weekend and, and we feel like we've lost everything we have. We feel like we're isolated, we're alone, and that we're forgotten. Or others of us, we walk through the doors and we go, you know what, I think I, I basically got everything I could ever want. But I find myself searching and longing for life or wondering if there's more to this joy around Christmas. You see, regardless, some of us may find ourselves in the middle. All of us today, just like the shepherds and just like the wise men, find ourselves in a space of waiting. You see, we've looked at this diagram the last couple, of years, the couple of weeks, and all of us today find ourselves in a place of waiting in between what is and what isn't, what is, what is now and, and what's next. And it's in this space, as we've talked about, that, that we, can, we can experience hope if we grab a hold of Jesus by faith, regardless of what the circumstances are. And the reality is the gift of joy that God offers to us is radically different from the joy that the world talks about. Because it simply doesn't matter what the circumstances are that we're navigating. Regardless of this waiting period is marked by pain and hurt and trauma, or if it's marked by great anticipation and excitement, the reality is that that gift of joy is available to all of us today. And so I want to take a look together today, the rest of our time, at just three really important things that we need to understand about the gift of joy and there are things that can change everything for us. Things that will allow us to grab hold of it and to be found faithful in waiting well. And so the first thing that we see both in the shepherds and the magi is this idea that, that joy is not found in a number of things. It's not found in money. It's not found in the number of zeros on your check or the number of zeros in your bank account. Joy is not found in our stuff. It doesn't matter if you're driving a Tesla or, Cor or Corolla, all right? It doesn't matter if you have a five-bedroom home or if, you, you, if you're living in something much smaller. It's not found in our stuff. Joy isn't found in romance. It's not found, you can't, you, it's not found in whether you're married or you're not or whether your marriage is going well or it's not. Joy is not found in kids. It's not found in whether your kids are behaving or not. It's, praise God, all right? Um, but it's not found in children. Or maybe you're in a place where you're like, you want children, and I understand that. But it's not found in our children. You see, joy isn't found in our position. It's not found in that if we can just get that promotion, if we can just get that director title, if we can just move to the next ream on the ladder. It's not found in power. 
Joy is not found in people answering to us rather than us answering to people. It's not found in food. I almost didn't put that one, but I'll just say, but it's not found in food. Joy isn't found in friends. And I'll tell you, I have some great friends. Hopefully you do too. But joy is not found in friends. It's not found in our health. It's not found in whether our body is functioning properly or if, or if things are just falling apart. And joy is not found even in freedom. Now God desires us to be free if we're walking in bondage. Your brothers in Kiwani, I know you're days away from being out those doors to freedom. But what I want us to know today is that joy is not found in freedom. You see, joy is not found in anything. Anything other than Jesus. You see, all of those things that I just listed, we find happiness in those, don't we? But here's the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness leaves as quickly as it comes. Joy doesn't function that way. You see, joy is not found in anything, but only in Jesus. And hear me, this line may be very different. What we fill in that line may be different for you and for me. But joy is not found in anything other than Jesus. You know, this week I was, as I was just doing some research and engaging just um, the scripture and just wanting to understand this idea and this gift of joy, I, I actually began to look up the original um, Greek for the word joy. And the original uh, word in Greek is the word hara. Turn to your neighbor and say hara. Look, you know Greek. You learned something today. This is good, all right? But that word literally translates joy. But if you look at the word in which that word, that word hara is derived from, it's the word haris. Say haris. Haris is the Greek word that, check this out. This is so good. It's the word that means grace. So check this. Joy, hara, comes from God's grace. Haris, which personified is who? Jesus. Jesus. Joy is not found in anything but in Jesus. In other words, things can be falling apart around us like the shepherds, and we can still walk in joy. In fact, look at how the shepherds respond as they go back in Luke chapter 2, verse 20. It says, the shepherds returned. Where did they return? Back to the fields, back to the plains, back to where they were, back to their isolated kind of uh, meandering. And it says, and they returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Let me ask you, what had changed in the shepherds' lives? Did they all of a sudden have a reputation? No. Did they go back and did they now have friends and their social status? No. Nope. Was anyone going to listen to them when they told them that they saw this angel? No. But the one thing that had changed is they had encountered Jesus. You see, our joy is not found in anything. Only in Jesus. Now, it surprised me, and it may surprise you, and it surprised me as I was looking at the New Testament, and I was realizing the Apostle Paul, Apostle, uh, missionary church planner Paul, almost every time he writes about joy in the New Testament, he writes it in the, in the context or associates it with suffering and hardship. I mean, there's many examples of this. But in fact, here's just one. Let me just show you one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe what? Suffering. You welcomed the message in severe suffering with the joy, the hurrah, given by the Holy Spirit. Now check this out. This word right here for suffering is the word thris. Thris. And here's what it means. It's literally this picture of incredible pressure. In fact, the scholars, one of the first times this word was used... It's the picture of, a, of, of the act of somebody being bound with ropes, being put on their back and on their chest, a large boulder being placed on them that would, cru it would crush them to the point of death. And it's in this context that Paul intentionally uses this word because he wants them to understand the trauma and the suffering that these Thessalonians are walking through. But yet in the midst of suffering, there is joy, that gift of joy is present. Now I realize this may be an extreme example for us today, but here's what I know about life. That we walk through seasons of life, these seasons of waiting that sometimes are marked by great pain and by great trauma. 
There's moments that we walk through in our life where it just feels like the walls of life are falling in and there's nothing that we can do to endure it. But here's the deal. Even in the midst of that trauma and suffering, the gift of joy is available to us. Much different than the world thinks about joy. The reality about joy in the biblical sense is the reality that joy thrives in the presence of hardship. Joy thrives in the presence of hardship. I mean, we see this throughout the New Testament. Obviously, we just looked at one example uh, as Paul referenced it. But, but think about Mary and Joseph. These two s- sacrificed tremendously, didn't they? But yet they encountered great joy. Or how about Anna that we talked about a couple weeks ago who, who was a, a widow for, for decades, walked through incredible hardship, but yet there was great joy. I mean, think about Jesus himself, right? In Hebrews 12, it says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. There's this connection with suffering and joy. Think about the New Testament church where there was significant persecution, where where men and women are being beat and killed and stoned for their faith. And yet there was this remarkable joy. You see, joy thrives in the presence of suffering. Look at what James writes. James is Jesus' brother, the one who literally died and suffered for his faith in his brother in Jesus. This is what James writes in James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. He says, consider it pure what? Joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, whenever you're walking through suffering, whenever you're walking through hardship, or whenever things just get really hard, James says, consider it pure joy because he says, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Faith and joy thrive in the presence of suffering. Why? Why? Because faith or joy is found in Jesus. It's found in Jesus. Now, this is, the reality is, is that joy is found only in Jesus. It thrives in suffering. But here's the reality. This is really good news for us. Is this reality that joy can't be stolen. Joy can't be stolen. In fact, turn to your neighbors and say, ain't no way you're stealing my joy. Go ahead and do that. That'll be good. Yeah. The good news is that joy can't be stolen. It can't be stolen. Why? Because it's based in Jesus. We find it in Jesus. It's a gift that we get from him. Look at Galatians chapter 5 where it says this. It says, but the fruit or the gift of the spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace, it's forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This joy cannot be stolen from you and I. Even in the midst of hardship, The gift of joy is available to us, but here's the key. Joy can't be stolen, but it can be forfeited. It can be forfeited. In other words, as we navigate the the circumstances of life, even in this season of waiting and Advent today, we can become so consumed at pursuing things that are ultimately going to lead to disappointment. We can become consumed with with pursuing position or power, prestige or reputation or money or gifts even that we can ultimately set ourselves up for disappointment and find ourselves in a posture of literally forfeiting our joy. But true joy, the joy, the gift of joy that God offers for us can't be stolen. In fact, look at Jesus, Jesus' words to his disciples, John chapter 16. This is some of the last words that Jesus says to his disciples, mere hours before he is betrayed. And look at what he says to his disciples. He said, so with you, now is your time of grief. Listen, My betrayer is coming. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be killed. You're going to lose me for a while. But he goes on to say, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And check this out. And no one will take away your what? Joy. No one will take away your joy. Listen today. If we're to grab hold of joy, we have to understand that joy is only found in Jesus. It's only found in Jesus. It's not dependent on our circumstances. And we can forfeit our joy, but this, in this season of waiting, this season of Advent, as we move on towards Christmas, it's my prayer that we will grab hold of this joy and that there is no way we'll let it go, that this season of waiting will be marked by our passionate pursuit of Jesus. And so you may be asking, so what? What does this mean for me? 
So what? I realize some of us walk through the doors this weekend desperately needing just a word of encouragement. Some of us walk through the doors maybe in this season of waiting with, with great anticipation, anticipation and excitement. And we're like, yes, I can't wait for Christmas. This is awesome. Others of us walked in the doors today in the midst of grieving or pain or despair. Just honestly, a sense of overwhelmedness that we just want Christmas to get on and done. But what I want you to know today is that joy is available to each of us regardless of how you walked in. You've, whether you resonate with the shepherd or the magi, we can grab hold of the gift of joy, but we have to know today that the gift of joy is available only through Jesus. And if you're in a place this weekend where you have not stepped into relationship with him, you have not, you have not encountered his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness, can I plead with you? Don't let another day go by without encountering him. That joy, that peace, the hope that you're longing for is only found through a relationship with Jesus. And today can be the day that you step from death to life into relationship with him. And I encourage you, if that's you, and you just sense that stirring going, you know what, that's right. That's the thing I've been looking for is that joy, that hope, that peace. Turn over your teaching outline. There's three simple steps in a sample prayer. It's not about the words, it's the heart and just acknowledging that Jesus, I desperately need you. You came on Christmas Day. You gave your life for me. And today's the day that I give all of me to you. And I hope that you'll make that decision today. But if you made that decision and you're here this weekend, the reality is we all need to ask ourselves one question in this season of waiting. And it's this question of, what are you pursuing as you wait? What are you pursuing as you wait? Are you pursuing stuff? Are you pursuing power? Are you pursuing kind of like well-being? I mean, these things are good. It's just they don't lead to joy. This is a deep and probing question, isn't it? But it's one that we have to ask if we want to be found faithful to wait well. And if we answer, ask this question, we find that maybe we're pursuing something other than Jesus this Advent season. My ask of you and for me is to recalibrate, to, to place our focus on Jesus. And may we be found faithful to live out the words of Hebrews chapter 12, where it says this. It says, and let us run with perseverance the race, the life marked out for us, regardless of if things are going well or if they're not. Fixing our eyes on who? Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, for the joy, the hurrah, set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of God. It's Jesus that we seek in a season of Advent. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our hope. And Jesus is our joy. So let me ask you today, what are you pursuing or maybe who are you pursuing as you wait? And may this season of waiting be marked in your life and in my life by a passionate commitment and mission to grab hold of Jesus and to embrace the gift of joy that he offers us. In a moment, our worship teams are going to come and they're going to lead us. But I ask you, don't rush through this moment because this question can change everything for you and me if we'll let it do the deep work that he needs to do. So will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you have made the gift of joy available to all of us, regardless of where we're from or where we're going, Lord. Then whatever the waiting space looks like today, the gift of joy is available for us. And Jesus, we acknowledge today that you are the source of joy. We can only find joy through you. So Lord, I pray today that you would find us faithful to fix our eyes on you, Jesus. You are the author and the perfecter of our faith. You are the one who modeled what it looks like to embrace joy in the midst of challenge. And so God, I pray today would be a defining moment for us. May you find us faithful to wait well. And God, may we encounter the joy that you, Jesus, came to give us on that Christmas day. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen.